All right. In this video, we're going to look at the C, the reserved words in C. There's a section in this link here where we have under C programming a listing of all the reserved words. You could also go to the internet and find lists um, at various places. Here's one. And they'll be grouped under different types. So all of these are things that you cannot have as variable names and they do something. And for the CS202 class and beyond, the expectation is that you these come up in a file that you're looking at, you know what they mean. I'm going to have a file here in the class directory reserved.c where we'll do some experimentation or some examples. I'm going to skip past um, some of these that you already know. Um, so the statement reserved words, most of these you know. So there's four for a for loop while maybe we'll just, okay, just for good measure, we'll put some in. Um, so for and i, i equals zero, uh, or let's say i equals 10, i is greater than zero, i minus equals three or something. Okay, so we'll do this as we're going to make changes to this and see what happens to the output. So there's your four, your four loop there. Um, and while loop, we'll skip. Um, it does repeated things. Um, so we'll show do while though. Some of you may not have seen that. Um, so if we want to have another one percent, let's say, do something different. So after this uh, for loop, i has a value um, well, there was 1, it got printed as 1 and we did minus equals, so it's going to be negative 2. Why don't we do in here, we'll print uh, we'll do i plus equals 3, so we'll go back up. So then the first value that gets printed here is i has a value 1. We add that to the character a, which would be b. Okay, so there we see that's a do while. So the do while happens at least once happens at least once and then you check your condition. Um, okay, we have break and continue in each of these. So let's say that in here I only wanted to do odd numbers. So if i is not odd, if i mod 2 is 0, so if you divide by 2 and there's a 0 remainder, I'll continue. So what continue does is the loop that you're inside of it goes back to the beginning and skips doing part of it. So now we see we don't print 10 or 4. When we had those, we did a continue and go back to the top of the loop. A break will go to the end of the loop. So if I put a break here, that will um, stop the loop. And if I put it like this, then we don't even get a chance to do it more than once. Um, normally you would have the break inside of an if test, um, but there we see we print the B and then we skip to the end of the loop. So there are your loops, and um, using break and continue to go to the beginning or go to the end. Your conditionals, I'll skip those maybe with if, if else, if, else if, 
and L. So those are different ways you can do that. Um, we'll take a look at this. Um, some of you may not have seen this. So let's say um, index equals 5. Um, so if I wanted to do some something different for each um, say value of x mod um, mod 3. So I could have something like this So those are all the possible values, mod 3, remainder after dividing by 3, 0, 1, 2. So I could do something like this. Um, I can use a switch statement as well. So switch x mod 3. That's going to look at the each of these. And then we can have case 0 do something. Uh, maybe we'll just print 0. Case one case two okay so the the way this works is when you have a switch statement it's going to evaluate whatever's in here, just like doing an if or, or a while. Um, and whatever the value is, it looks for that value in one of these cases. So case is a keyword. Do I have that in there? Yes. So case is a keyword that has that meaning. So if, if x is 5, then x mod 3 is going to be 2. Then what the switch will do is it will go to this case and start running code right right after that. So what do we do? We print F2 and then it just keeps running code from there. If we let's say this is uh, 3 instead. So if we have x equal to 3, the remainder is 0, we would go to the 0 case and it would print 0. Let's just verify that that happens. There's the 0. This break here is needed to stop, stop it from running into the next case if I don't have the break there. Then it goes zero, but then it just keeps going and that has to do with the code that this actually generates. This is just the way it is. If you're designing your own language, you maybe would um, make that break not be uh, required. But if you don't want it to run into the next case, you have that break. All right, so that's our um, statements, and then we have return, which we see here returning zero from main. If we put a return zero here, then what would happen? And remember, um, as you're watching this, you want to pause right before I'm about to run it. Think about what you're going to see, and then let it run. Okay, so if I put a return 0 there, it stops the function, main is done, and it doesn't do anything else. All right, that's probably review for most of you. We have uh, most of the rest of the keywords are having to do with data types. Okay, so we'll be in our um, data type. Our basic data types, um, character, and int are the basic data types. Float and double are for floating point. So these are integer types. These are decimal, decimal point, floating point. So these will often be care is one byte, int is four bytes, as often the case. And float is, um, well, we'll have to see. We'll see how that we figure this out. So let's do printf. We'll say care c int i float f double d. Um, we can put values in each of these. 
put zero into each one just to have something there. And one way that we can know how many bytes there are is with the size of operator. So size of C tells us how much space does C take. Size of I, size of F, size of D. This is going to tell us how many bytes. Uh, we already had something called I, so we'll just do this. Okay, so there we see one byte for the character, four bytes for the integer, four bytes for the float, and eight bytes for the double. Is, so this is, I'll put oftentimes, it depends on your installation. So the size here had, that has an effect on the memory used and also on the maximum values. So if we look at um, the character, an unsigned character with one byte, Note max for one byte care is 127. If you work things out, that's what it is. And min is negative 128. So if we do um, so let's say we set C equal to 127 and then we do plus plus C. Okay, so what happens here is we do the print statement, it's going to do this, it's going to plug in the result of this expression into there, and the result of that expression is we set the value into C, and then it's going to be printed. And for this one here, that's going to match up with this, and the plus plus C, that means we're going to increment C before it goes in to be printed. So let's see. So there's um, 127, and after we incremented by 1, it is 1. So that is um, because 127 is the maximum possible value. Okay, we can do the same thing with um, negative, so negative 128 is the smallest possible value. And you see that if we subtract from negative 128, we actually get down to um, we sort of wrap around on the other side. Let's, um, yeah, so that's looking a little bit strange. Let's do this. Um, so C equals 127, and then we'll print F C, and we'll do C++ print F percent I C again. Okay, so that's more like what you expect. So we're at, um, we're at 127, we add 1. Um, if you look at what how this is stored in binary, which I'm not going to do right now, but it wraps around to the negative. And the same thing would happen if we started at um, the most negative value, did a minus minus, and then printed. We start at the most negative value, 
we decrement and we end up wrapping around. All right, so the same thing will also happen with integers, but then the maximum value, instead of being 127, is about 2 billion uh, max for um, or byte int is 2 to the 31st power minus 1 and min is two, negative 2 to the 31st power. That's about negative uh, 2 billion to 2 billion roughly. Okay. So maybe we'll do the limits and um, how these are stored in another video if you need it. So we have uh, one byte integer, four byte integer, four byte floating point, eight byte floating point. Okay, then we are into, um, let's go to storage modifiers before we do the compound types. So these are all the different ways that we can um, so modify what the variable type is. Um, so auto, let's see, let's do these signed and unsigned, short and long, those you probably know. So if I do unsigned um, C equals 127 capital C, if I do C++, sorry, capital C, two different variables with, based on case. So there we had 127, we increased by 1, and we got to 128. So the range for an unsigned, it can't be negative now, so I'll go up to um, note max min max for unsigned care is 0 to 255. So if we're at 255, we would see the wraparound. Uh, okay. Uh, unsigned care. So there it is. There's the wraparound. Um, and the reason I, yeah, we'll leave it at that. All right, unsigned care, you can do unsigned int as well. And then the um, min max for unsigned four byte int is zero to roughly to, let's see, exactly two to the 32 minus one, and that is roughly four billion. All right, so that's signed, unsigned. Now we can do short and long. Let's do unsigned. We'll do short int s, long int l, short float fs, long float fl. Let's see what we get here. So we'll have percent %i, percent %i, percent %i, percent %i for the number of bytes that we have here. Size of s, size of l, size of fs, size of fl. Okay, so they're not allowed to do long uh, float or short float. So what about double? So double, we're allowed to do um, long as a modifier, but not short. So let's call that DL. Okay, so what do we have here? We have, okay, there's an extra percent I in there that's not being used. A short integer is two bytes, long integer is eight bytes, and a long double is 16. So we have options for floating point, um, 
float is four bytes on our system. Uh, double is eight bytes and long double is 16 bytes. For integers, we have a one byte int. We have a two byte integer, which is short. Four byte integer is just plain old int. And then we have an eight byte integer, which is long int. We could try doing long, long int. But that's the same as a long int. So it lets, it lets us do that, but it's not actually different. Um, so we'll go back up to our notes here. So note um, short int is often two bytes, long int eight bytes, long double 16 bytes. That will depend on your installation and your computer. Here we're on the computer science server. All right, so those are ones that you'll often use, those modifiers. Um, const is means that we can't change a variable. So if I say const um, x equals zero, printf percent i x, that's fine. I can do that. All uh, right, I have to call it something else. And I call it con for const. So there's a zero. Now if I try to do, let's say, um, con plus plus, there's an error there that says, sorry there, const int. So I want to do con plus plus. All right, there's my error. Um, I'm not allowed to change con. So anything that would change con, I the compiler gives an error, which means it didn't compile. This was the old version of the program that ran. Okay, so that's const. And then volatile and restrict are hints to the optimizer, which we tend not to use. I'll put this under um, for optimizing high performance code or something like that. We're not going to do any of that in this class, but if you look at operating system code or things like that, you will see these. Okay, so volatile tells, um, we could do it here. So volatile int x or I don't know, vol or something like that. So this will compile and then I can use vol just like um, I can use vol just like any other variable <clears throat> but that's telling the optimizer that this vol is important it should stay in a register in the CPU it shouldn't be um, kicked out. If it's, if it's going to be used uh, repeatedly often then the uh, we want to keep it in the CPU and not have to go out to memory because memory is slower than the CPU. So I could run it and there's not going to be any difference. Um, note, accessing vol might be faster than other variables. You can't put all your variables as in the CPU, but some number of them could stay there. Okay, so it doesn't have any effect on the correctness of your code or what you can do with the variable. Uh, well, so it has one effect on what you can do with the variable. Um, if you're volatile, then I believe, let's just run this. Okay, so that runs fine. Um, if I try to do um, int star p equals address of all, so there's a pointer, something to store an address, and I want to take the address of vol, and there it gives me Um, it gives me a warning. Depending on my settings when I compile, that would be an error. So um, you shouldn't be taking the address of a volatile variable. If a volatile variable is staying in the CPU, then 
this address of is talking about where it is in memory, we don't want to use that because that defeats the point of having a volatile variable. So I'm not going to use this in this class, but you should be able to answer multiple choice questions about it. Um, restrict has to do with um, if we have a function that, so why don't we do, let's see, C language restrict. If we have a function that's taking pointers in, so this function here, here we have a, a pointer to an integer, here is another pointer to an integer. So it's some kind of promise that um, whatever this variable, whatever you can get to through this pointer, um, you're only going to change that by going through this pointer. We're not going to go through some other pointer. So here we have star p++. plus plus. We're using the address stored in p and we're going to modify it. This q is another pointer. So if we do this and these two point to different integers, then this code obeys the rule about restrict. Restrict is saying that I don't want to change anything that I can get to through P by going through some other pointer. These are different. What they have here is they called it um, where these two potentially while this loop is going, so it's not real important um, to know the details of this, but whatever this loop is doing these two pointers could be pointing at the same thing in different parts of the loop while this loop goes. And that doesn't follow the way you're supposed to use restrict. And this is again something that can be used by the optimizer if you follow the rules. Okay, so that's it for those. Now we have some about scope. So scope is, note scope is where and when you can use a variable, how long it lives. Okay, so auto is the default. We could say auto, but that's implied. So that actually is a keyword that you'll see in old, old code, but current C, you don't need it. Static. Um, will often be used inside of a function. So let's do a function. If I say static int a equals zero, then I do a plus plus printf a. Okay, so if I run this down at the bottom of my code, I should see that value printed. It's a zero, and then I add one, so I should see a one. That's the last thing printed. There's the one. Now if I run it again, let's put two variables in here. I'll also have int b equals zero, and we'll do b plus plus, and we'll, we'll print them both. So for b, it'll behave like we expect. Every time we run the function, you get a new variable b. This B only lives inside of the curly braces that it was declared in. So we run, we run fun, B is zero, it gets incremented and printed. We run fun again, there's a new variable B, it's zero, it gets incremented and prints as one. So there we see these are the values of B. Every time we run the function, it starts at zero. Um, A is different. If we do it, each time it's remembering the previous value. So if you're inside of a function, then static means that this is really a global variable. It lives throughout the program. We can only access it inside of these curly braces because um, that's, that's the way it is and that makes sense. So we can only access it here, but the value will live on. Um, so this will tend to be used if you have something that you want to keep track of inside of a function and that function is the only thing that needs it, the only part of the code that needs it. Um, so instead of declaring a global, 
you may declare a static local variable. If we do static to a global variable, then what that means is if I have other C files in my compilation, they are not allowed to access this variable. If we have multiple different files, you can share global variables using the extern keyword. So if I had, so let's just compile this. That compiles and runs fine. If I had extern int something, then what that says is um, that should be looking at another file for the something. Let's put this, so we'll say hello equals zero, something equals zero. So we have an error now. Um, so the something variable, when I get down here and I'm trying to use it, this extern says that some other file actually declared that variable. I'm not making a new, I just want to use their variable. So that means there has to be another file with that variable declared. I only have one variable right now, so that's an error. So that is static and intern for global variables. Static says other files are not allowed to see it. Extern says I'm wanting to use somebody else's variable. <clears throat> okay, register. Um, Okay, register is actually what I was talking about for volatile. So, um, register is the one that's trying to keep it in the CPU and you're not allowed to take the address of. So let's, uh, let's call this register. And then if I try to do int star p equals address of vol, this should give a, an error. So address of register variable is not allowed. That's an error. Uh, okay, so volatile is different, right? Volatile says that the variable might change even though this code doesn't change it. So if I have something um, volatile int vol, okay, vol equals zero, and then maybe the next line even I have printf or if all equal equal zero um, something okay so that will it should print zero there could be some code in between where I do things up here what the volatile says is there may be some other code that makes changes to vol they could be running simultaneous to the code we're at right now. And the reason that could happen is if you're in a multi-threaded program that has shared variables, or it could be that, uh, well, there's a couple other reasons, but so there could be other things going on that access this variable. In our program right now, there's not. Um, but what this volatile says is the optimizer is not allowed to do something like skipping this if test. Right now, if we optimize this code, which we would do with um, GCC reserved.c-04, capital O4, that would be level four optimization. What the optimizer would do is it would say, here vol is zero, here I'm checking if it's zero. It didn't change in between, so I can just skip this if test and go straight to the print. That saves an instruction. Okay, if you're just looking at this file, that's what it looks like. But if you have a volatile keyword there, the optimizer will not do that because you're telling it that the vol could have changed somewhere else while this code is running. Okay, that's volatile. Um, and register, that's all of these, I think. Let's see how we are on time. Fine on time. Uh, okay. So we've done the basic data types. We'll do now compound, some compound data types. Um, I'll just, I'll just um, say what's happening on these examples here. So struct, uh, well, 
we'll do this. So we'll do reserved 2.c. Okay, so struct is used for making a new type, a compound data type. So struct, um, example we did in the other video was for uh, complex numbers. Let's do um, coordinates. So we might have an x coordinate and a y coordinate if we're talking about graphing functions. So then inside of here, I can have struct chords uh, p1, p2, p1.x equals 0, p1.y equals 0, maybe p2.x equals negative 1.5, 6, p2.y equals something like that. That'll compile. Error. Uh, okay, let's see. All right, so it doesn't print anything. This, what this means is inside of the p1 variable, we have an x and a y that we can use just as regular variables. I could put anything I want in here. I could put um, maybe a name for the point, or I have 10 characters for the name, or whatever. Okay, so if we have to keep track of data where there's a bunch of related things that go together, then that is a struct. And we have to declare it like this. We use the struct keyword to define what the structure is, and the struct keyword to declare the variables. All right, so that is struct. All right, union, union, um, so what happens with the union is you have we have a bunch of different variables in here, it's like a struct, but what we're supposed to do with this, the right way to use a union is when only one of these is going to be used. So if we have a number, it's either going to be an integer, a character, a float, or a um, or short int maybe, and um, space shared on these variables. Uh, so let's see, we have float and int are four bytes. So let's see what happens if I do um, So if we do uh, u dot i equals zero, print f. Okay, there's zero. So now what if we do print f percent? Um, so we have a zero for f as well. Now what if we do u dot i equals 42 or something. So we'll do that there. Uh, okay. All right, now we see something interesting. So I is 42, and F shows up as not a number. Um, let's look at what these look like as just bits. If you do percent %x, then that shows the hex value of the bytes. So we have something going on. All right. So I don't actually know how it's storing this stuff, but there's some kind of overlapping in the storage. It could be the case that it's using the same exact bytes for u.i and u.f. And what the programmer is supposed to do is only use one or the other depending on the situation. 
So we could have maybe here inside our chords, we could have union num n or something like that. And then we could have care which. And then the character would say, is this n going to be an integer character or a float or a short? So there'd be something in the program to let us know which one we're actually supposed to use in the union. It could depend on what's going on in the program. What the compiler can do is it can save on memory by storing all of these in the same memory cells. So we can't actually use all of them in the same part of the program. We have to use one or the other. Okay, that's union and this for keeping your memory down. Um, so another keeping the memory down, I won't type it in, but here we have a flag variable. So a flag variable typically will be just 0 or 1. And then we can say that in the structure that we only really need one bit here for each of these flags and what the compiler will do is it will pack those um, so that you're not actually taking four bytes for this flag you'll be taking one bit it'll pack those all together so if we look at well we can do this so let's say we'll just copy exactly this here and then we can print so that's three integers in three bits so what if we print f percent i and then the size of that so if it's not packing them it'll be three times four bytes so three times four bytes would be twelve right four 8, 12, but actually it's storing all of those in one integer. We could have 32 of them there and it would still store them in one integer. If I put a care um, on those, then it should store it in one byte. So if we're going to have eight flags, this would be a way for us to store them in one byte. Looks like it's still using four bytes. Okay, and then when you could use these these um, these parts of the structure just like always. So you have a variable. You do dot flag three. It'll be one bit zero one. Okay, um, type def. So type def allows us to give a name for something. Uh, if I want to say, so I could say here, there's my structure, and now I could say type def struct chords, maybe chords. And what type def does here is the last thing is a name. That's a name I can use, and it will basically be the same as this. So anywhere that I would have said this in my program to declare a variable, I could say this instead. I could say struct, sorry, chords p3. And p3 will be a chords struct. Um, I also could have put it, so I could also put it all together. So type def struct flags and then flags. And I could do my flags variable down here. Flags. F or something. Okay. So that's the type def, and that makes it so it's shorter for us to type. We don't have to type the struct flags. It's normally how it's used. Uh, okay, so we've done everything in the, so let's see, in the data types we still have enum and void. So erun is really an integer, um, but with with names for things. So we could have a enumerated type. So enum apple orange banana. We could call this fruit. 
making sure that compiles. So, all right, we have a type now called enum fruit. It can be apple, orange, or banana. So I can say enum fruit, uh, capital F, F equals banana. Okay, that's allowed, and we could do if F dot, let's see, F equals banana, then we would print banana and f equals just to see f. So it's actually storing it as a integer, but it allows us to use these words instead of 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And if we look at banana, that was the second item. So what it does by default is this is really the value 1, this is really the, or 0, this is really the value 1, and this is really the value 2. Okay, so it's a shortcut so that we can keep things in an integer if there's a discrete set of values that it could be, and we can use the names for them instead of um, integers. And we could do the type def here as well so that we could just not have to type the enum keyword. So we could say fruit f2 or something like that. If we want the integer values assigned to these to be different than the default, we could put something else in here. Okay, so now if we run it, we should get an 11. There's an 11. So if we have some other values that we want, the normal default is just 0 up to the end. That is enum and void. So there's void. Void means no type. And you'll use that when you have a function. So we can have a void function that doesn't return. That's one thing. Um, and the other place where you'll have it is a void pointer. So if I want to have a pointer to fruit, I, I could do int star p equals address of f because an enumerated type really is a integer. Um, it gives me a warning. Depending on your compiler settings, it may give you an error. Um, now if I want this pointer to point to, maybe it's going to point to a fruit, maybe it's going to point to a double, depending on what's happening in my code. Um, this would, would uh, again, it gives a warning, and depending on your compiler settings, it would give you an error. This is something you probably shouldn't do because the type of P looks like it's pointing to an integer, but it's actually pointing to a double. So if it's going to be pointing to different types, then we can do void star. So that means it's a pointer and it's not specified what the type is. Or we would have to know in our program some other way what type it is. And if you look up the help on malloc, the return type of malloc, that's memory allocation, it allocates some memory, it returns a void star. So it's returning an address in memory that's not of any particular type. It's just a spot in memory. All right, so now we have everything in the data types. Everything in the storage modifiers. Um, the only other thing in our list was the preprocessor, and I'll just say that they're there. Um, so we've been using pound include. We just put a pound define in the other ver in the other code. Um, there's other things with so if you can do if test else, and that happens before the code is even compiled. So I could have something. Let's say um, let's say I have hello there. That should be a compile error of some kind because. That's just in the middle, so that is a compile error. If I have pound if zero, pound end if. So what this does is it checks, okay, that's a zero, so this shouldn't happen. 
and it'll actually do that before it compiles. Um, what you'll tend to have this for is if there's something that needs to be different depending on what you're compiling on. You might have something like pound if def mac os or something like that. Um, it'll be, it won't be mac os, it'll be something else you'd have to look it up. But then you'll often have, um, that's where you'll see it oftentimes. Um, okay, so that's, that's that. And then we can use, um, right, we can use any of these to do that. Something else to, to have is the, in debugging, this is helpful. Uh, there's a predefined this thing, which is not a variable, it's a macro. Um, that's the line, so you can use it like a variable. It's always going to be the line number of your current wherever you are, and then we have the file date and time. So we could have a print statement here. Um, compiled at percent %s on percent %s and time and date. Those are going to be string constants. So you could have that in a, um, in a version statement. So you could have a version statement in your code that prints when it was compiled. And that doesn't change until you compile again. For debugging, you might have something that's going wrong in your program and you just want to figure out what line it's at and you don't have the debugger for some reason or you don't like the debugger so you could do this put that in a few places and until you compile again as long as you don't change the file you could go back and look line 58 so 55 there's 55 right there 58 and 61. So if you're printing a variable and you don't know, um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Okay, so I think that is it for all the keywords that you're supposed to know about. Have fun with keywords.